And Minister, thanks so much for your time. Have you been given any sense of how much the coronavirus is going to hit the higher education sector in dollar terms? Well, I've been in discussions with the sector, Kieran, as we work through the impact. Obviously, we really have to wait and see because it's still very much uncertain as to how the virus is going to continue to spread and the impact that it's going to have. So, look, if this can be managed in the short term, our hope is that we will see a bounce back fairly immediately. That's what we saw under SARS. Uh, but it's really just watch, wait and, and see. And we're putting all the contingencies, contingencies in place that we can uh, as the disease continues to spread or the virus continues to spread. But really, the next two to three weeks, I think, is going to be absolutely crucial as to where we go and, and what the ultimate impact will be. Standard and Poor's said their, their estimate was that it would hit the university sector to the tune of $3.1 billion in lost fees if Chinese students weren't able to make the first semester of this year. Is that estimate, does it sound right to you? Is that a fair assessment? Well, look, there, there will be a significant impact if we lose the whole of the first semester, uh, but we're not there yet. So I, I very much uh, wait and see what happens. But if we did lose the first semester, that would have a significant impact. And Standard & Poor's have done their assessment. The universities are looking at, the, at the, the similar sort of assessments themselves and will be in a greater position to be able to detail it in the coming weeks. But my hope is that we will see some sort of a breakthrough and we will be able to get students here for the first semester, but we'll just have to wait and see. We I spoke to Andrew Clennell, my colleague, a bit earlier, and he's making it clear government sources are telling him that the surplus is now unlikely in this next financial year. If so, the higher education sector as an export, we know it's one of our biggest, obviously coronavirus would be one of the major reasons for that. Well, there will be no question if, if the coronavirus continues and we can't get students here for the first semester and, and God forbid, we couldn't get them here for the second semester, uh, that will have a significant economic impact. Uh, I mean, I think it goes to show the importance of the international higher education sector to our economy and we will continue to work with the sector to do everything we can to help them mitigate against this. Uh, I've been in ongoing discussions with, University of, uh, with Universities Australia, with the group of eight. Uh, we will continue those discussions. I'll be having further discussions this week. Uh, there are other aspects of the higher education sector as well which will be impacted. The student accommodation market, for instance, all those providers who provide English language tuition, they will all be impacted. So we'll continue those discussions. As I've said, the hope is that we will see some sort of breakthrough in the next two to three weeks, especially when it comes to quarantining. But look, if that doesn't work, we will work with the sector and we will make sure that we can rebound when the time arrives. Obviously, we've got bigger issues at play in terms of health impacts and so on. Uh, but in, in an economic sense, in a budgetary sense, the government's done everything to get to surplus, but delayed, it seems, yet again by external factors. Well, you know, the first thing we've got to remember is, you know, how fortunate we are to be in such a strong budgetary position at the moment. If we hadn't taken those hard decisions to get the, ba the budget back to balance, uh, we wouldn't be in this position to be able to deal with these headwinds which have hit us, the bushfires, the drought, now the coronavirus. So strong economic management to this date by the government has put us in this position where we are looking at future surpluses. Now, if we need to deal with the impact of the bushfires, if we need to deal with the impact of the coronavirus, the Prime Minister and the Treasurer have made it clear that we do want to keep our economy strong and we will invest in those sectors so that we continue to have jobs as an absolute priority. But we are in a strong budgetary position at the moment. We will deal with this and obviously uh, when the budget's handed down in May, we'll know what those final figures look like. A couple of weeks ago, you suggested that some private schools 
shouldn't have put travel bans in place, that they should follow Commonwealth Government advice. In hindsight, do you, do you accept that they were right? No, my position all along, Kieran, has been that we should follow the medical advice. So the medical advice at that time uh, was very clear as to what schools should do. Um, some schools went beyond that. Now, I said at the time, that's their responsibility and they had the right to do that. But the position of the government was clear that we were going to follow the medical advice. And that was my position when the medical advice became a lot stricter and was going to have an impact on the sector. Our fundamental priority right through uh, the coronavirus has been public safety and making sure we listen to the medical experts. And that's what I've been very consistent uh, right throughout this is saying that public safety, especially when it comes to students, whether it be school students or whether it be university students, would be our number one priority and it continues to be so. The reports today that there was another option in terms of quarantining of those that have been uh, uh, repatriated uh, from Wuhan, and that is to potentially screen them at the Richmond Air Base and then under a New South Wales health plan to have them quarantined in hospitals in New South Wales. Why was that rejected by the federal government? Well, there were a lot of things which were looked at, but uh, the Richmond Air Base is a, is a working base. So we had to take a, a number of considerations into account. Uh, but the fact that that, that is a, a working air base was one of those factors. So the government considered a number of options and I think made the right choice in going to Christmas Island. Uh, and now we're looking at other facilities, but you've got to understand that that air base at Richmond is a working air base. So it wasn't, it, well, while it was an offer made by New South Wales, it wasn't appropriate in this, in this circumstance because the New South Wales government well, well, we has apparently said it was ready and willing to help, but the offer wasn't taken up. Well, there are, um, you know, and it's, it's wonderful that they were ready and willing uh, to, to offer and assist, but ultimately in the Commonwealth has to make these decisions and the, the Commonwealth has to look at a range of factors, including the fact that, that the Richmond Air Base uh, continues to be an operating air base. So we made the decision based on a number of factors. Uh, we, we thank the New South Wales government for, for their offer but we have to make these decisions ultimately and we make them on a wide range of factors and that's why I think the right decision was made with Christmas Island. We saw some dramas with the National Party this week and uh, the uh, National Party rebels now as they're being referred to after uh, the, the vote, the vanquished essentially in that National Party leadership vote, they've, they've made some threats to the government and apparently directly to the Prime Minister too in terms of potentially crossing the floor. How does the PM manage this? Uh, well, I, I think that the PM will manage it like he manages all, all issues cool, calmly and focusing on the Australian people and the Australian nation. And, and I know all, all, national, all my National Party uh, colleagues uh, will be making sure that they're putting the Australian people first, especially at this time when we're dealing with drought, bushfires, uh, we're dealing with the coronavirus, we've got the potential for floods in, in parts of Queensland and New South Wales. They, like all my colleagues, will be focusing what, on what is best for the Australian people. And they will also know that the best type of government, the best form of government is a government that, that delivers for the Australian people on a united front. So I'm sure that all of us will be focused on what's important for the Australian people. The, co the complexity, though, is it's not just about uh, personal ambitions, is it? This the, the divide within the coalition right now that the Prime Minister has to, has to manage, do you accept that there is a, a deep divide over the issue of coal and climate change, those related issues? I, I don't think there is. I think we've got a, a, a clear path forward. Everyone knows that the economy has to transition. Now, what we want to do as a government is make sure that it transitions in a way which protects people's jobs and protects the economy uh, and make sure that we're putting the economic importance of transitioning as an absolute priority matched with the environmental priority. Uh, we, we all know and we all understand that. We all know that if we tank the economy, sure, that would reduce emissions, but it, but it would 
destroy jobs. That's not the way we're going to go about it. And I think we're very much united in that front. We know we have to transition, but we've got to do it in a responsible uh, and in a way that's going to manage the economy and manage jobs. And does that include that $4 million case, business case for the Collinsville coal-fired power plant? Because that was announced over the weekend. Uh, is, this a, is this something that the federal government should be doing, in your view, to be stumping up cash where the private sector isn't stepping in? Well, this is a, a $4 million feasibility study to look at how we can be providing um, cleaner, more efficient, low, lower emissions technology to provide baseload funding into northern Queensland. Now, this is goes to the heart of, of the, the most difficult issue that we face as a country in transitioning to a low emissions economy. How we continue to provide baseload power to, to industry, especially in regional areas, so we can continue those jobs. So we've got to do it as we transition in a way that so we can continue to provide baseload power. This is our biggest challenge. This is where we really need the technology to take leaps and bounds. But the Prime Minister has made it very clear, we're not going to leave regions um, jobless in, in the pursuit of reducing emissions. We're going to reduce emissions in a way that takes regions with us, takes local economies with us, so we can all do this together. And that's what that four million feasibility study is all about. And is, should there be room then, should there be consideration for the government to provide ongoing financial support beyond just the business case, this feasibility study, to help get it off the ground? Well, it well, well, obviously, let's have a look at what the feasibility um, study says first. We've got to see whether it is feasible or not. Obviously, there's a, there's a, a lot of requirements uh, involved here, including uh, state government requirements. So let's have a look at the feasibility study. But I think the point is a crucial one. Let's not lose, the, lose um, you know, awareness of the fact that as we transition, we have to be able to make sure that we've got that base load power, which will ensure that our economy will continue. So to you're grow, open to federal to government those funds, industries that rely on to get what, it no, up and what running. What I've said, Kieran, is let's wa let's wait and see what the feasibility study is. We we could have a debate about whether there should be some funding or, or not. We don't even know what the feasibility study will say yet. So let's have a look at what the feasibility study says. And just finally, we saw that proposal on the front page of The Australian yesterday, that the idea that the government's looking at uh, stepping up tax on LNG producers to help protect the surplus. Matt Canavan, the former Minister for Resources, slapped it down immediately before uh, many had seen it. This is an interesting situation the Prime Minister's facing right now in terms of trying to manage a couple of, well, well-informed but outspoken backbenchers on this particular matter? Well, the tre Treasurer was very clear in his response that uh, there's, a, there's a study that's going on. It won't be handed down before, before the budget, so it's not in any of his considerations as he's framing the budget. So I, I think this is a little bit of a storm in a teacup. And finally, uh, last question is on the, uh, the sports issue, sports rorts program. We've seen another one, $150 million fund. This one was called the Female Facilities and Water Safety Stream. Apparently 60 million of that, 40% of it went to two Liberal marginal seats. Does it pass the pub test? Uh, well, look, these were election commitments which were made in the lead up to the last election. The Labor Party made $250 million worth of election commitments in the lead up to the last, last election. Uh, we're going through the process of assessing them. Uh, they, they've obviously got to be funded uh, by a department in a program. That's all being, being looked at. Uh, all electorates uh, were recipients of election commitments before the last election. Now the government is looking at how we make sure that we've got programs in place at the various departmental levels to be able to put them in, in place. And I, I'm sure those electorates, which are recipients of these, these projects, like the um, parts of my electorate who are recipients of election commitments, uh, will be very pleased when those programs are in place or those projects are in place. Should there be more transparency, though, to these sorts of programs? 
Well, it's one of the very difficult issues, Kieran, because you've got MPs who, who know their, their local communities and then you've got our public servants who obviously have to put in place programs and there's always this balance as how much should the public servants ultimately decide a project or, or, or the results of a program and how much input should local MPs have okay. and this is you know for, for time immemorial being the issue that we face my view is you do need to have input from your local MPs because they know the community now how we get the balance right in these programs and projects is something I think we will continue to look at uh, over the next five to ten years because it's been a challenge for both sides of government getting the balance right on this. Education Minister Dan Tien live from Hamilton in country Victoria thanks very much for your time this morning. Appreciate it.